I am so happy to welcome for the second time in uh, the Peter Redway. Welcome, welcome, Peter. What should I mention? Cambridge and Harvard. Moscow State University. In 1963-64. And later on, you stayed on as a, as a professor in London School of Economy. And for over 20 years, you've lived in London. And for all these years, you've been closely cooperating with Amnesty International, and you've been involved in censorship. And you've been also involved as the uh, uh, translator and publisher of the Chronicles of the current. Uh, I understand that you and Amnesty worked on this publication. And last time when we met in February, we uh, we discussed your book Uncensored Russia. Uncensored Russia. Where, where you published the first 11 issues of the Chronicle uh, in English with your comments. Among all the uh, diversity of your books and monographies and publications that we could uh, mention here, I believe that the highest number of um, highest volume of publications was actually uh, uh, seen by your book about the uh, political abuse of psychiatry. And here's where it's complicated for me because I'm also opening now the CV of Robert Van Voren, and if I just read through the main uh, points on that, on that CV, it'll be for at least 10 minutes. Robert, what should I mention? What has to be mentioned when we speak about you? Uh, studying in the Netherlands. And then what? The fact that you are the secretary of the Podobinek Foundation. The, the, the fact that you've worked for many years in Bukowski Foundation. This is still clear, but then it gets complicated because then I don't know how you managed over 20 years uh, between 1980 and 1990, you traveled to the, Soviet, to the Soviet Union for a year. How did you manage this? I don't know. You were arrested in 1983, but you still continued traveling to the USSR, um, to the USSR and this is beyond my comprehension. There are also many institutions that I could this now like which you like joined in a specific year and then and it continues to to the current day maybe you can mention the key one i think the most interesting ones are well i intended to study with peter redway two times two times i got a place at london school of economics but, but since i was involved in campaigning uh, for uh, for the uh, so I actually had my plans changed and I uh, graduated from Amsterdam. There are different titles I can have, but, but together with Peter, I was one of the co-founders of the organization that back then used to be called an International Association on the Political Use of the Political Use of Psychiatry. It was a temporary organization that uh, organized a campaign against political abuse of psychiatry. In, uh, with the aim to exclude Soviet psychiatrists from the Global Association of Psychiatrists. But this organization is still, conti still continues. 42 years later, it's still is, uh, operating. It's the organization that I'm heading, the Global Federation, in fact. It still continues its work. But besides that, I'm also heading the uh, and the Sakharov uh, Center at the Countess University, and I'm Sovietology. I, when I started 10 years ago, I, I, everyone was 
laughing because the whole Soviet Union, but I'm, uh, I'm post of Soviet and post Soviet studies, and everyone, and by now everyone understands the Soviet Union still uh, has, hasn't left us. And uh, I, I teach in Kaunas, in Vidisi, and also in Katowice. In I think that's it. Well, I would also add that you organize, you participate in the organization of the Sakharov uh, conference. Вообще говоря, очень много у вас очень сильного связи с Украиной. And you also are close to Ukraine. In your CV, you can. It's rather standing out that you have a lot of um, a lot of Ukrainian related topics among your, your workplaces, but also your articles and texts you, you published. So we have the two co-founders, founding fathers of this whole area. So I will be uh, obviously asking how this area was um, developed to the, this area of studies. Uh, but I also would like to first introduce our third participant. It's Rebecca Reich. Welcome. Hello. Rebecca teaches at Cambridge, and her area of expertise is the literature and culture of the 20th century, Russian, Russian literature and culture of the 20th century. Rebecca studied in Harvard. Yeah. Her, uh, the book that we will be discussing today was published in 2018. I think it would be better if it, Rebecca introduces the book later on to the uh, call. But just the way I imagine we would be, uh, we would structure our conversation today, which probably might not work. We might go different directly. But I wanted to talk about the reception. I wanted to talk us to talk how this area was considered and perceived. What they did know, what they didn't know, how. Various institutions were uh, slowly getting involved into uh, addressing the topic. How the how the institution how the readers uh, received your book, and I believe that what Rebecca have done is a very important complementing part of this conversation today because we said the one of the way we could look at literature is uh, precisely the reception angle, the reception of the literature uh, around the topic. So we will probably begin, and of course, as usually, please, as usual, please uh, write down your questions. You can put them on the in the chat window, uh, but also you can um, uh, you can ask your um, questions by unmuting yourself at the at the final part of the conversation. I'd like to open today using this book. This is. This is a 1988 published book. Yes, Falcon Redway, um, Psychiatric, Psychiatric Terror, How Soviet Psychiatry Used to Suppress Dissent, I believe. Um, and I think it's a book that you aim to bring into Russia. Oh, you don't, you're not aware of, of this book, right? Perhaps I could ask you to start to, uh, today's conversation with um, what was the state of, of the studies around the topic when you first entered the field? I, I started uh, being interested in the psychiatry uh, in, in, in psychiatry in, in 1971. That was, uh, that was the year when Vladimir Bukowski a well-known human rights defender who lived in Moscow when he was not in uh, the concentration camps. He sent me a large package, 150 pages, accompanied with, a letter, with his letter. And that was, th those were Russian texts 
10 official reports. on how dissidents were treated by, by the leading Soviet psychiatrist, for example, by Morozov, who was the head of the uh, Serbsky Institute. Psychiatric Institute of Serbsky, named after Serbsky. In his letter, Bukowski asked me to translate those reports and to forward them, send them over to psychiatrists in England with the request to read those official reports and uh, give their opinion as to whether the as to whether the diagnosis given to those dissidents given by uh, our Soviet psychiatrists about what mental uh, illnesses was, was the, were, were those diagnoses uh, correct? Were they correctly um, institutionalized um, into some possibilities of uh, you know, prison-like facilities? Uh, because that's what actually happened to the dissidents. And Bukowski asked me to publish the results of this um, of this case in, in English press. How uh, Peter, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how how could Bukowski get those documents? Because quite often, even the patient is unable to reach and find the documents relating to the cells. Those documents were we see were given to the uh, lawyers who were actually defending defending his distance. So not from the psychiatric hospital, so it's not a medical uh, uh, record, but it's something that came through uh, judiciary. Yes, but those were re uh, real valid psychiatric, psychiatric expertise results. And back then, there were several lawyers who were very, you know, subtly, subtly, uh, covertly handing over to the to dissidents of the documents they could, uh, including such uh, psychiatric assessments. And Bukowski uh, collected those from the lawyers. I'm not sure how. I don't know the details, but so he collected those and forwarded them to me. As a result. results together with a few friends I formed a small group in London that at first dealt with the translation of those documents and dissemination of them among uh, English psychiatrists and then we collected their responses their opinions 44 English psychiatrists uh, just um, came to the conclusion that Bukowski, the Bukowski materials are are not uh, justifying uh, those distances being institutionalized. And they wrote a letter, which we then published in a Times paper. And, and starting with that day in 1971, the topic, the area of political use of psychiatry became, became being more and more um, interesting for the wider public. And several psychiatrists joined our group 
and all together we fought. And we fought for, uh, we aimed for the Western psychiatrists to stop supporting Soviet psychiatry. And as Robert already mentioned earlier, Soviet, Soviet society and as a psychiatrist had to, had to leave the global psychiatry associations. If they hadn't left themselves, they would have been excluded. And this is a result of our work. As a result of our work that Soviet society psychiatrists had to leave the association. Yeah, I understand, do I understand correctly that twice you were, um, um, the, you were twice approached by uh, the Russian Soviet dissidents. Once you were approached uh, with Chronicle, to asking you to translate that. And the second path was Bukowski also forwarding you the uh, secretary assessments. N only those two times, no one approached you with anything for the third time? Over the 25 years, and the, the, of those over those 25 years, dissidents have been sending me a lot of documents, uh, notes of protest, whole books sometimes, Sometimes those were just uh, articles. They asked me to publish those materials in the West. And to forward those materi materials to London BBC office or Radio Liberty so that those materials are broadcast by radio to uh, over to the Soviet Union and through this way and this way to uh, avoid being censored by the Soviet censorship. May I then ask how how your books were received? Peter Redway and Block. Re okay, Se several editions. Sydney Block. Who's a psychiatrist? Unlike you, he's uh, he's it's his area of expertise, psychiatry, being a psychiatrist. So the first book you published was in 1977. Then your joint publication, then uh, Robert's book in 1983. Then again, you and Sidney Log uh, in 1984. Then Robert and Sidney Block again in 1989. How, how, how all this happened? What, what was the development behind this timeline of publications? What happened over these years from one book to the second, to the third, to the fourth? What changed on the level of uh, what the authors understood about the things happening in the Soviet Union? What documents you could reach um, what, that became uh, available? And I also am, am very interested in how the readers responded to those news. Um, this is something which they're not interested with or or interested. For example, there is um, Bull's letter to Kobolev in I think I think in 1977 where he speaks of Voinovich, probably about probably um, a poisoning attempt that had happened earlier, but probably he speaks of uh, the as uh, um, um, and probably the response of uh, both that the reaction here in the country is absolutely incommensurate, uh, is uh, incomparable. We, we thought that this will be a bomb, uh, but this actually gained not, uh, it, it, no response or virtual response. So my question is, uh, how was the interest, how was the public reception response to the, the topic that you tried to, uh, to put into the center of public attention? I can say, you know, I, I joined this field in 1977. It's the year of Honolulu, where uh, the uh, Soviet psychiatrists were, were uh, condemned for the first time. 
Can you can you uh, develop this line a little bit in in the Bukowski's forward? You said I think not so many of you would have been um, uh, worthy of your um, prize if you ended uh, in the uh, psychiatric ward and then of the of the World Psychiatry uh, um, um, Congress. The, the result that I hope will not be repeated in Honolulu this year. So it's. Um, so it's 77, I believe it was a couple of um, months uh, after he was exchanged for Kovalan uh, and he writes this in Bonn. So what changed between 71 and 77 within the National Psychiatrist Associations that we're dealing with this question and in public opinion as well? Within the association, I don't think much changed because psychiatrists and especially those psychiatrists who were part of the International Association of Psychiatrists, they really were not keen on uh, tackling and addressing this topic. Because, you see, because it's a closed circuit, it's a very close circle of psychiatrists who were afraid that if we start criticizing Soviet psychiatrists, we might be the next ones. So you have to understand that There is a researcher in Vienna who's, who's uh, investigating the, this, but quite a few of the Austrian psychiatrists who were connected to the World, World Congress in Vienna in 1983, when the resolution was uh, adopted against like, political use of psychiatry and there were, and there were conditions put on the return of Soviet psychiatrists. Those were psychiatrists that were actually had been previously involved in the euthanasia program of the Nazis. There were there were psychiatrists in South America, South America who were involved in tortures. So, bringing in the human rights narrative to that area for them it was dangerous. It was risky. Of course, step by step, this was overturned. Everyone came to the realization that if there is a, abuse, that that, that there was abuse and the public, uh, public opinion and the media responded and there was a lot of uh, active response to the uh, human rights area in general in the in Soviet Union. But then in 1989, when, when it was already, we were already in the last of the historical times, everyone wanted to include the Soviet psychiatrists back because that's not the Soviet Union anymore. For us, it was very hard to prove that in psychiatry, actually not much had changed. Because uh, when it was the wave of, uh, when the dissidents were freed from prisons, the last ones to be freed were actually the ones who kept in psychiatry because they were considered crazy. And they were they were treated the longest and longer than the rest. And um, Rosef and Vartanian and others were the architects of this system, and they were agents of KGB. Who was the father of uh, Peter Morozov, who is uh, the general secretary of the Global Association of Psychiatrists, which is a nightmare. And it, is, it was very hard for us to find a compromise in Vienna to even set the terms for the return of so Soviet uh, psychiatrists to the uh, World Association. That was a very difficult period. I remember 1991, the, the World Psychiatrist uh, Congress happened in Yokohama, and it, there was a discussion of uh, a political views of the psychiatry in China, and People's Republic of China. And I remember that Juan Jose Lopez Obor approached me, who back then used to be the general secretary of the World Association, and he told me, well, Robert, you understand, 
when, when the situation in the Soviet Union, we, we fought this so much, but it, it is different now with China. It's, it's, it's the situation is terrible. And when I and I'm thinking, the World Psychiatric Association never fought Soviet uh, uh, psychiatry without us, without our activity. So now they are they they consider themselves to be the heroes, and the okay guys. But the problem actually persists. It's still the same. Nothing has changed there. И мы, и мы заявили свои протесты, на их, они будут обсуждены вскоре после нашей, после нашей поездки. И эта, эта поездка была очень важна с точки зрения освобождения. И нас было 25 человек, прежде всего психиатры и несколько дополнительных людей. Что для нас было шокирующим, и то, с чем, нам, с чем мы не справились с вами обязанностями, как вы с ними. То, это, то, что... If we look now at the Soviet time of political abuse of psychiatry, for most of the cases that happened in Russia and Ukraine, there were specific cases in Lithuania, in, um, in the Caucasus Republics, in Georgia, but the majority of the cases happened in Russia and Ukraine. When the Soviet Union uh, was uh, disbanded, Ukraine had a complete, um, completely new psychiatric association created, which con con continues to this day, a Ukra Ukrainian psychiatry, psychiatry association. We've actually founded an, uh, a bureau, an office in, in Ukraine, uh, the bureau in that investigated the political abuse of uh, psychiatry. It was headed by Nella Forbun, a psychiatrist who was who had, was connected to the Oksana Meshko case. For 10 years, she headed the office uh, as as a kind of compensation, as a retribution for what he what she did by basically sending that dissident, uh, a healthy person, a healthy dissident to a psychiatry hospital. So in Ukraine, made it made active investigations. We opened, we reached archives, opened cases. We we'll, we we'll look for dissidents who were incarcerated for 
propaganda or more anti-Soviet agitation. Okay, articles 191, 1, uh, 170, 170, and we reopened those cases and um, and um, and um, the system was rebuilt and was renewed. This didn't happen in Russia. Um, in St. Petersburg, the key figures were, was Yuri Nuller, who spends nine years in Kolyma, uh, an, an amazing uh, person, a very nice person and um, very honest and psychiatrist. And so for some time, he had a, an association of his own. They, they had a, a magazine, they published a magazine. Um, the, another center was uh, Tomsk with Professor Kurnetov, who, who founded Siberian Psychiatrist Association. So as everywhere uh, in, in Russia, they were just kind of strangled or, and just the Moscow clique remained. It's, it's a gang from Moscow that controls everything. And the situation is, might be actually not much better than in Soviet times. Yuri Nuller uh, died rather young. He right, died yet, 10 years ago. I remember we, he worked in the Bachelor's Institute and we wanted to put a memorial plaque on, on the wall of the Institute. But the director of the institute, who um, who was the head, the chair of the Russian Psychiatrist Association, he he laughed at us. Why? Nuller, Nuller is not of interest. That's the unpleasant situation, and one of the factors why the abuse of psychiatry is continuing in Russia. The situation in Ukraine is completely different. What is also of interest in 1995, with me and we are closer to a conference in Kiev to try to understand how the system worked. And we had representatives from almost all the republics. From Belarus, we had uh, Signev, uh, the then head of the Belarus Psychiatrist Association. And so there were presentations, reports, and he commented, well, Robert, I can tell you that, that we had our own investigation. And I can, be, I can proudly say that we, we did not have any single dissident ending up in psychiatry hospitals. I told him, Roman, because you almost had no non-dissidents. And he laughed at it because he obviously knew that there was a, a, a dissident uh, who lived in Moscow and spent uh, uh, seven, eight years in psychiatry hospitals as well. So, so he was very cynical about it. Here in Lithuania, they discussed the political abuse of uh, psychiatry. They acknowledged that it had happened, but they never went as far, uh, went further. And because Lithuania is a small country and everyone knows each other. They knew, they knew everyone who was involved, but that one person is my colleague, we studied together, blah, blah, blah. So they did not want to follow through till the end of, of the things that happened. Robert, can I, can you, can I bring you back to those years when you only, when you just started investigating the field? So the, the departure of Bukowski from Soviet Union uh, when he was when he left for the West. What did what did that change? Um, did this make the this uh, area much more visible and uh, of um, this story much more known? Well, for me, this is a key event because he was the one I followed into the area. We started corresponding in in. In 1977, he introduced me to Peter. That's how our contact was established. And, and this is very, this is just a coincidence or something that uh, this um, photo with, with me and, and Bukowski, me with the long hair. This is the first time when we met face to face in 25th of August in 1978. 
on the tenth uh, tenth uh, ten, on the ten years commemoration of the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet army, and of course his voice in the West was extremely important, especially in the first years because he was he was uh, speaking everywhere. He was so well known; everyone uh, remembered him, and so he was in all the newspapers. And for us, this was crucial. Okay, but what happened in 1977? Was this related? Did it did it co contribute uh, to the topic appearing in newspapers? How how these voices did these voices? This was this influence. Uh, was there an influence of the um, on the on the voting then in the casual association? So what had an impact? Where people's uh, people's stories, books published, a combination of all of it. Here's the book by Peter and Sydney Block. It was extremely important because it had a full list. It had a full list of the cases that they knew about back then. So, yes, the, the list of names of people who went through psychiatric hospitals as dissidents. Yes, and. And they, it was unbelievable for them that this was happening, and that the number of uh, that the amount of uh, evidence based um, confirmed by psychiatrists that that was unbelievable, and and that resulted in the campaign that led to the exclu uh, on the, of the uh, departure of Soviet psychiatrists from the World Association of Psychiatrists. Okay, there's Bukowski, Bukowski who wrote to Peter Radway and sent him sent him the document. Yes, there's Podrabinik, who in the same 1977 publishes the book on uh, punitive psychiatry or political abuse of psychiatry. Am I correct in understanding that that was all this material was not collected by by one single person? Yes, one person published the book, but there was always a team of people gathering the material. And if so, did you meet that team? Do you, do you know who was on the team? Who were working commissions at the Helsinki group? Bachmin, Vyacheslav Bachmin, Mire Kaplun, Irina Grivlina, Eric Severos, Alexander Podravinek, and Alex Anatoly Karyagin, the psychiatrist from Kharkiv, and Alexander Volshinovich. Volshinovich is a, yet another psychiatrist on the team who assessed psych dissidents and gave them diagnosis so that so that they could have the proof in their hands that who, so his assessment proved that they were not mentally uh, mentally uh, disabled or um, uh, people. He, he made an assessment of more than forty. Um, and make made extensive reports that was something heroic of uh, Volshinovich and um, Karyagin uh, continued that work um, when Volshinovich left for the West because of the threats uh, from the authorities when, and so he ended up in England and Yuri Freydin was he involved? Yuri Lvovich Freydin, Freydin. Okay, he was not involved. I don't remember this last name. I think we will soon we'll soon move to questions because everyone is eager to ask those questions as in the comments. But Rebecca, I would like to I would ask what it means to do the research in this area today, and um, how how this how this intersection of literature and dissidents and and uh, the topic of madness or mental health. What what were you what do what how how the literature re responded and reflected uh, this when when this had been happening 
or maybe you wanted to work on something else, uh, joining the conversation that we had previously with Peter and Robert, because you have a knowledge, a piece of knowledge that no one else has. Allow me to say a few words about the idea of the book. My book stems from the uh, situation of uncertainty and a dead end that people who were placed in a psychiatric ward experienced during that period. From the very start, I felt that these people were not only prisoners of these medical institutions, but also of the very term of dissidence, of the very diagnosis. This term, dissidence or dissent, started meaning a mental illness or an abnormality of the mind. That is why I felt that from a literary point of view, it was this um, lack of a future that the dissidents wrote from and some nonconformist writers wrote about. It created some a space for self-determination. And redefining this term of dissent as thinking differently is what I try to understand in my book. I explore this term in its different connotations, thinking differently than the government, thinking differently than the other, and thinking differently in terms of creating a text that express various opinions and that bring to the foreground the idea of dialogue and difference. So in this book, we cover both things. The writers who are politically active and the dissidents. In a certain way, they all talked about insanity and mental illness and psychiatry. I can go on. I felt that if we could say that being put in that mental ward reduces the uh, interaction with the patient to a monologue of the doctor, of the psychiatrist, both the dissidents and the writers were trying to reconstruct the dialogue through various images by means of the literary discourse through literary imagery, techniques, and all of this allowed them to hold fast to their mental health and their understanding of the relationship between psychiatrists and the government and society and their patients. So in that way, this literature becomes a, an authoritative discourse which allows patients to counteract the practices of psychiatry and of the government. The notions of legality and appropriateness, so this is the main idea of the book. Thank you so much. At this point, I would like to invite you to ask questions, the audience to ask questions. There is uh, an icon that you can use. It's the raise hand icon. You can click on the reaction button and click on that, or you can type your questions in the uh, chat. I see a couple of questions. So Maria and then Alexei. Oh, Maria said she was second. 
Sí. Okay, Alexei. Good day, everybody. My apologies. I cannot switch on my camera right now. I have two questions. Both are quite broad. The first question is, My question is for Robert. To Robert and Peter. So there's the question of what came earlier, the medical school or the political order. So there are two points of view. There was the school of Snyzhnevsky with the sluggishly um, progressing schizophrenia and that was developed because it was useful for the government. The other point of view is that um, there was it was the government that made this order to the psychiatrists as a result of which Snyzhnevsky came up with that diagnosis. So what do you think came first? What is the, how was it really? And I have another question. Do I ask it straight away? Let's start with the first question. The second question is about medicine and history. I came across the fact that Ukrainian publications about psychiatry mention surnames. Uh, connected to medical practice, so the only the initials, not the surnames itself. However, for a historian, it is really important to know who all of these people were. How do you think it is possible to uh, to get out of these controversial practices? The medical practice, uh, so uh, medical practice and the secrecy of the patient, but also the its value for historians. Stalin period, the, the, the idea of abusing psychiatry for political purposes grew up somewhere in the political establishment in the Soviet Union. And they turned to Snyzhnevsky to develop a theory which would justify political abuse of psychiatry. And so Snyzhnevsky did that and uh, he became closely uh, involved in the political process in the Soviet Union. Um, but whether he did it uh, as a result of a political order, uh, as you were wondering, or for some other reason, we, I at least am not clear. Um, what I am clear about is that Snyzhnevsky became very, very close to the political establishment in the Soviet Union and um, he he would do whatever they wanted him to do. Uh, so he was a very um, a man was he, he was a, he was an unusual man because he he had his own opinions apparently, but he also clearly followed the establishment line. So let me leave it there. Um...
да, вот это злоупотребление This psychiatric abuse did take place before Andropov when um, um, when my book about the Cold War and psychiatry was published uh, this person came up to me so when yeah so uh, when this book was presented half of the room were dissidents and the uh, and the others the other half were new agents of the security service of ukraine and this person came up to me said he read my book he asked me to talk to him and he said you, all you're saying is correct but what you need to be aware of is that andropov introduced a real system he realized this would be very helpful. He used reports from the regions, from the provinces. There, there's a very extensive report from Krasnodar regions. Well, there were several thousand dangerous, um, dangerous persons who needed to be hospitalized, but we don't have enough places in the ward. What do we do? And then Andropov responded by saying that the situation was similar in the other regions. And new hospitals were introduced in the year 75, 76, specialized hospitals in Blagoveshinsk and Volgograd. So that was the decision of the Palut Bureau. In order to understand the situation fully, we have to realize that we are looking at the dissidents in the psychiatric wards as those who are mm, stuffed with medicines. But when I started working on this topic, I realized that the people who were really ill, this gray area, uh, that the real patients were also experiencing torture. Ten thousand individuals were uh, residents of the psychiatric ward. Ten thousand people who were excluded from society. I worked with um, uh, legal psychiatry in Ukraine. And I see that the attitude towards patients is the same. When Kayagin wrote his article, he showed that the people who were arrested for libel, and that was a maximum of three years, they, uh, they were in the psychiatric ward for three years. Those who were uh, accused of anti-Soviet propaganda. They were in the psychiatric ward for seven years. And in post-Soviet psychiatry, and I don't think the situation has changed in Russia, the number of years or months that you spend in the psychiatric ward does not depend on the diagnosis, but on the sentence That is why the entire topic of um, psychiatric abuse needs to be looked at globally because the situation is worse than might seem. Um, sorry to interrupt, but there's a second question from Alexei. So is it possible to determine these reasons um, when a, a dissident would be sent to a psychiatric ward and not to a gulag? And at which level was this decision made regarding the place and the time? Because uh, any kind of insanity should have some kind of system. Does this insanity have, uh, is there a method to this madness? 
as I said, the term in which, uh, for which they would stay in the psychiatric ward depended on their sentence and what they were accused of. And they looked at how to break this person best. It was a very organized, well-organized system. And we felt like every, every third dissident would be uh, sent to a psychiatric ward. But when I worked in the archive, it was very interesting because we worked very closely with the fifth director of uh, the head office. Uh, we were working with uh, German translations of the documents and we thought that it was every third dissident, but we saw that, that it was actually half, 50%. So more than we had even thought. So in the summer of 89, Philip Borkov, uh, in Berlin, came to Berlin with Stasi's boss, Milke. This was in Eastern Germany. Milke says, you know, we were conducting an investigation and half of these people are actually uh, mental, mentally ill. And he says, these are not mentally ill patients. These are dissidents. These are anti-Soviet persons. Thank you. And Alexei, I think we missed your second question. My second question was about this contradiction between medicine and uh, history. What do I do if I need to know who was in which psychiatric ward? Now I open the Ukrainian book, Alekin Karatyanka, and I see only the initials. How, how do we work with this contradiction? Uh, this is not a contradiction. It is um, a rule of medical secrecy. So now the Ministry of Health in Ukraine wanted to disclose this information. Uh, there are 12,000 cases. Uh, they wanted to open up this archive to the public. And we were against that. We said, this is uh, a, a thing of medical secrecy. There are some things that cannot be disclosed. But they say, well, this is a political case. But they're not only political, but they're also medical. So in, in the medical world, there are completely different rules. So we uh, created a protocol together with our Western colleagues about which information can be released and in what format. Um, this is an interesting investigation because there is just one psychiatric hospital from which we have all the records, but it's still to be delved into. It's really important not to repeat the mistakes of the Soviet past. Thank you. And Maria, over to you. Thank you. My, I have two questions as well. My first question is to all three experts. My first question is about uh, long distance diagnosis that uh, Peter Redaway spoke about. So English psychiatrists looked at the documents and medical records of patients and attempted to re-diagnose 
certain patients. Was, was there any discussion about this procedure of re-diagnosis? Because this is done without the patient in the room. And this is quite unusual, an unusual practice for psychiatry. What guidelines, what rules did they follow when re-diagnosing these patients? Were there any debates? Because this is something less obvious from the, from the perspective of the procedure. And after you answer that, I'll move on to my second question. No. What I can say is that the rules that exist at present were developed. The idea of um, medical secrecy and ethical norms were different from those that we have today. And I believe that this is one of the best moments of um, the campaign against the abuse of psychiatry. Because as a response to this situation, many uh, psychiatry associations have started developing guidelines and ethical guidelines for their work. And the guidelines that we use now are different from those that were used in the 70s. If Volushanovich was the psychiatrist now, the one who diagnosed those future political prisoners, we would not be able to do the work that we do today. The norms and standards that we apply today are so radically different from what was what was used back then. this topic of frustration. Um, Guzman, who spent 10 years in these wards, he does not want to get, um, get, a hand, get his hands on his file, although it is openly available to the public in the security services of Ukraine, but he does not want to know who uh, who put him in there. He doesn't want to know. The situation in Russian psychiatry is very bad. Various kinds of abuse keep happening. But as a result, in the international world of psychiatry, um, you know, this, this led to the creation of many uh, documents and guidelines used in psychiatric practice around the world. Um, yes, this, um, this is similar to what happens in times of war, of course. Uh, Do you think that it was correct of, uh, for these people to be forcibly interned in psychiatric hospitals? And so it was just sort of yes or no on that. They were not asked to give their diagnosis uh, of these individuals. So the question of the criteria for the, their diagnosis that they might make, it didn't come up. That was that was not part of it. It was just a, a very simple question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
so so basically he, so basically he tries to uh, somehow um, uh, hint at uh, the uh, possible outcomes of this procedure, right? Uh, whether uh, the psychiatrists, uh, this, uh, this was correct uh, procedure, and these people were in, uh, in incarcerated in a ward uh, legally, or they stick to the more hum humanitarian uh, agenda, right? So it, it was politically motivated uh, uh, demand request behind these uh, documents sent uh, by him. Yes, the, 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 there was implication mm -hmm. that the, the internments of these dissidents in, in hospitals was unjustified. That mm -hmm. was a hint mm -hmm. um, from Bukowski. But mm -hmm. um, all he asked the Western psychiatrists to do was, do you think it was right on the basis of this material to put these dissidents in possibly in mental hospitals. Mm. And they just had to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And um, most of them said uh, not, not justified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they did not give their own diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, 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 nazvali, what the книга, uh, uh, we mentioned this book of Karatienka. It was our project. And this is a bit of backstage. We were uh, looking at the stories of 60 people, Ukrainians, who had been arrested for political reasons, so anti-Soviet propaganda and slander. They were in Ukrainian psychiatric wards. We had access to their medical records. And we opened up this investigation again. It was Alekina, former psychologist who used to work for the government. There was a young a uh, legal psychiatrist and Kretyanka. She was around 60 years old. It was awful for her. She used to work at the Sierpsky Institute. She knew all of those medical personnel. She saw these diag diagnoses uh, signed by her friends. She saw these diagnoses that she might have signed herself back in the Soviet times, but the record was of a person who was absolutely mentally sound. She realized that she was probably part of the same system. It was like a mirror that was painful to hold up to herself. And I met many Soviet psychiatrists who only after the collapse of the Soviet Union started to realize what they had been doing. I have a friend from Dnipropetrovsk who, who would walk around with this book, Biographical Dictionary of Psychiatric Abuse. He's in that book. And uh, he, he wanted to me to uh, show it to him, uh, to, uh, yeah, to my Western colleagues. And I said, well, it's best not to do that. But he says that it's really important for people to know that now I realize that I was part of this system. Who was horrified. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She what died she already uh, several years ago. Oh, oh. Uh, but she was a very, very, very nice woman. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, may I ask my second question then? Robert, you mentioned the government decided which. Um, what way they could break a person best, either through a gulag or through sending them to a psychiatric ward. 
were there other factors that, that came into play when these decisions were carried out? Let's say if they needed to, mm, to create a positive image for their satellite countries or uh, were there some other reasons or was it purely about human psychology? Like this person is quite uh, tenacious, so we're going to send him to a psychiatric ward. Yeah, I think the factors are mainly psychological. It's never black and white. You can't just say if someone is normal or not normal, normal or crazy. When Karegin was released in 1987, he visited me in Amsterdam and we were at a cafe. And there was a rally. Uh, they carried around a mirror uh, that, with a banner that read, have you ever looked at a normal person? And uh, when I explained it to him, he said, I, I don't understand. And I say, well, have a look at the people around in Amsterdam. Half of them are crazy. Life is so interesting because no one is normal. So he was a psychiatrist and that's how they were taught that there's either normal or crazy and nothing in between. Soviet Union. We've released them all. And uh, it's true there are still one or two people walking around who are critical of the Soviet system, but they are psychiatrically ill. They are not normal people. So we, being humane, we put them in mental hospitals in order to cure them. So that was a, a big boost to the use of the mental hospitals because it, Khrushchev did release not every, all the political prisoners, but mm -hmm. uh, most of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the few cases where officials publicly, an official publicly raised this topic, Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, the Archivia uh, uh, Stasi document uh, in the Stasi archive, there's a document from Bokov who wrote that Andrei Sakharov needed psychiatric mental help, but we cannot uh, offer it because of the movement, the international movement of, against, the, against psychiatric abuse. So we need to treat him humanely. So it was all over the place. And as far as I understand, the reason Victor Feinberg ended up in the psychiatric ward, it was um, on account of his teeth. Victor is a, a character. He's a great guy. I know him. They were just looking at where Mm, what would be best for every individual person. So Natalia Grabanevska spoke about how he was entered, into, uh, put into uh, a psychiatric ward because he, wouldn't, he couldn't be put in court. So as far as I'm aware, the circle of people around Andropov and Andropov his, himself was uh, very keen on this idea and they were giving the orders. That general was in Kiev. Of course, he wanted somebody else to carry the blame, but he was rather direct. So a question from the chat that I'm afraid to lose. Could you explain why so many people were in psychiatric wards? <clears throat> 
это простой подход. It was a simple approach. Like there, there is no definitive term. If a person ends up in a psychiatric ward, they don't know when this is going to end. You can do anything with pills. Like uh, Leonid Plush, he was given lots of pills that broke him. When he was released and sent to France, he did not understand what was going on around him. It was a terrible image. I mean, except for the dissidents. 10 million is more than 1% of the population. So normal people from the population were in this in psychiatric wards. So it rose from two to seven million. And there was not enough space in the psychiatric hospitals. Why did it experience such a boom in the 70s? Но без преступления просто они, ну как-то другие, или родственники хотят избавиться от них, или они Жаливали слишком много, часто, потому что, ну, крыша, это счет, никто ничего не делает. Это просто очень такая простая методика избавиться от людей. И в Китае то же самое. Там вот этот очень, очень распространен. Что у нас, я прошу прощения, с переводом? Ушел русский звук, идет перевод на английский. Oh. Простите. Пришел уже перевод на русском. Да. Задай его, пожалуйста. So there are more questions. If you have another question, Maria, go ahead. In the late Soviet Union, the same protocols were used to uh, towards ordinary patients as to the dissidents. And this is interesting. To what extent were these protocols different from those used in America or other or European countries? Because what we know from the works of Thomas Shash and Shesh, who talk about abuse of this system, is very uh, similar to what I'm asking about, but that's the 50s and the 60s. Are there any comparative works about the history of psychiatry that would look at these different psychiatric systems and compare them? There are such works, but Soviet psychiatry was completely broken away from um, international psychiatry. We talk about the 50s and the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. Uh, the changes that happened in the international community did not reach the Soviet Union. Um, and there's a well-known film about this in American cinema. And that's the situation of Soviet psychiatry. If we look at the documents 
governments uh, confirm that this is something inhumane. Even today, society wants to get rid of those who are different. It's a complicated issue. When we started helping activists in Belarus, it was difficult to convince them that they needed psychological help because they believe that uh, activists need to be very psychologically sturdy. There's no such issue in Ukraine. And this is when I see that 30 years of working in Ukraine has borne its fruit. Because there's a higher level of understanding of psychiatry than in Russia and in uh, Central Asian countries and whatnot. There's a lot of stigmatization, which is the result of Soviet psychiatry. Thank you. Uh, Ivan has been waiting for a long time. Hello. I would like to ask, in the Russian Empire, our people had a mostly Christian view of the, the human being. And after the Bolshevik Revolution, there was the process of uh, mm, destroying the Russian civilization. So um, churches were burnt down, cemeteries destroyed. And children were taken away from their families to turn them into Soviet individuals. So people could not pass on their culture to their children. As a result, instead of Christianity, a biological and psychiatric view of the human being, as I call it, became prevalent. And also, uh, abuse of this psychiatry took place. So I understand what abuse of psychiatry is. It's about uh, labeling people who think differently, saying that they are not normal, and they are mentally ill. But could you provide an example of psychiatry that is not abused? A, a good example of psychiatry? How it helped a human being? It may sound a bit strange. To be honest, I think that many of us know situations, many of us know uh, examples and cases where psychiatry really was helpful. So um, my apologies, this question is not quite uh, about the history of the matter, so even I might answer this question. So I would suggest moving to the next question. So, Alexei, you're next, and then Ludmila. I don't really have a question, but rather a response to what you just said about the scale of psychiatry in uh, the USSR. But I'm not sure if I can say it, if it's a comment, not a question. I believe that when we talk about this topic, we sometimes get confused. And it's important to differentiate between two groups. If we talk about those who were, if we talk about people who uh, were uh, considered mentally ill and thus they were not executed, for instance, they would send to a psychiatric ward instead. 
I know of about 1,500 people that we know of by name. At the same time, there was this practice of uh, forced hospitalization. And we know that in Moscow, every year, 7 to 800 people were hospitalized by force. And so the scale of this forced hospitalization was quite broad. In total, we might talk about tens of thousands of people in that period of time. And the third group are people who are registered with a uh, mental hospital. So it may be someone who uh, attempted suicide. So he, um, he was registered with the medical uh, mental hospital and this record remained with the person for the rest of their lives. And this actually created a, a lot of problems for them. And uh, the question of the extent to which it um, kind of ruins the lives of the people who lived in the Soviet Union is an interesting one. However, it is not quite the same thing as abuse of psychiatry. Because here we talk about political motives. Thank you. You're absolutely right. And they have rules for the government has rules for everyone and they use them accordingly. That is the answer. Mila. Does anyone study um, avoid uh, avoiding being uh, conscripted into the army and uh, the abuse of psychiatry? My main question is to Rebecca about literature as a reaction to the abuse of psychiatry. What texts are important to you? You also mentioned that writers show that uh, the government does not, uh, cannot uh, monopolize uh, come like good sense or mental stability, rationality. Have you worked with any literary techniques that reflect uh, some doubt in the value of rationality? Thank you for your question. I'm interested in texts, both of the dissidents and works of fiction, such as Beniti Tirafiv, Joseph Brodsky, and others. As for the dissidents, I write mostly about the text of Bukowski and Yishin Wolfing. I feel that for these dissidents, and this may be related to your second question, dissent. Dissent is defined as thinking differently. Thus, mental health can be proved by certain things that may be considered symptoms by some psychiatrists, Consider, uh, provided that these actions are thought through, have an aim, just as a mentally sane and mentally healthy person 
would do. I believe that these strategies are reflected in literature in, using several forms. Writers and dissidents in non-official reports and records, they often use dialogue, a kind of parody, satire, irony. And these are the techniques that create the dialogue. There is a multitude of voices. And that's why these techniques um, go hand in hand with dissent. Because dissent is about a dialogue of contradicting opinions. There are many literary allusions. For instance, dissidents often talk about uh, texts written by psychiatrists like, uh, or about psychiatry, like uh, Ward Number 6 by Chekhov. There are many allusions to such texts. These texts are also addressed to the community of readers who are united by this thinking differently. In that way, they are all dissidents by that definition. It's important because only together in, within this community can they redefine dissent as a variation of the norm, as a psychological norm in which all citizens can partake. So this is just a few general words about literary techniques, methods, and images that I've noticed. I hope that I've answered your question. But we're still operating with the idea, uh, the idea of the norm. So you kind of don't think of a discursive um, undermining of the norm. Yeah. And the next question. We have two questions. And one question in the chat. Good afternoon. I am Zorka Domic. I'm a psychiatrist and I live in Paris. I work in Paris too. I have Russian speaking patients here. I studied in Moscow and as a student, I used to work in a mental ward. So love you. I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Maria Vasilievna Korkina, Professor. I know that she could not work differently, even if she wanted to. Because psychiatric doctors had to adhere to certain standards. It was not possible to give another diagnosis. As a foreigner, I could not know everything because I was not allowed to speak to the patients. Of course, I could have, but I had to report what they said 
And one time I asked the patient why they were at the hospital and he said, I'm here because this is the Soviet Union. If I were in another country, I would not be in a psychiatric ward. And when the professor asked me what he had said, I, I told her. And I was told that this was paranoia. And that he told me this because I was a foreigner. And there was nothing I could do because that was a diagnosis. I don't think it was paranoia, but it was not possible to prove. And I had problems in the Soviet Union. So I graduated and started working in France. And only in France did I discover what had happened in what had been going on in the Soviet Union. I studied psychoanalysis. It existed before the revolution and after. But when I was speaking to Professor Korkina in Moscow, she told me that psychoanalysis was last century. It was rubbish. But after the Perestroika, I returned there and resumed my contact with my colleagues. We organized seminars. Now I write about my experience. And could you tell me which books that you have published about this? I would like to bring this together and there is a psychiatrist in France as well who also writes and compares the abuse of psychiatry in France and in Russia and the Soviet Union. I would be grateful if you could uh, leave, give me your email addresses and we'll exchange contacts and you'll tell me which books you've written and I would read them. I will send you a link to the uh, to the seminars to today's seminar and there is a list of publications. So if you just do a Google search you will find a lot. Robert has written down his uh, email address in the chat. I met Plouche and Guzman in Paris and we had uh, events, but this was a long time ago. It would be very interesting to be in touch. Let's be in touch. So a question from Bella and uh, one from Olga. Sorry, we can't hear you. Could you say that again? Should I read it? You can ask it again or just read it. Well, sometimes the term in a link it in any context to homosexuality or lesbianism or transsexualism in consideration of dissidents into psychiatry. And it's there a difference between Russian and Ukrainian Soviet period? Can imagine that the situation might be complex in that case. Um, yeah, um, um, 
can you say something uh, to that topic if if it's not complicated? During therapy at times, homosexuality was not discussed. It existed, but it was not discussed. Homosexuality was criminalized uh, and that criminal code was used against uh, dissidents. The difference between Russia and Ukraine. Ukrainian psychiatry was heavily influenced by the Moscow School. In Kiev, uh, the uh, psychiatric ward was directly answerable to the Moscow uh, Institute of Sietsky. Of course, there were psychiatrists who thought differently in all of the republics, um, psychiatrists who tried to avoid this topic, um, they preferred to send patients to Moscow rather than diagnose them themselves. There were several cases, uh, let's say in Tashkent, when Grigorienka, uh, Grigorien, uh, they wanted uh, the psychiatrist to give a diagnosis to Grigorienka, but he refused. All these years later, I've come to the conclusion that 80% of Soviet psychiatrists believed their patients to be uh, mentally ill. They had Soviet education, they were part of the Moscow school, they had no idea what was going on beyond uh, the Soviet Union and Moscow. And for them, a person who is ready to risk it all, uh, his social circle, his family, his, um, his job, he was not well. Something must have been wrong with this person who is ready to risk it all. I know someone who is the director of a psychiatric ward in Vinitsa. She later told me that when uh, Gorbachev became general secretary, she received the first materials of the plenum. She was shocked because uh, she was sure that he had this sluggishly progressing schizophrenia. She believed that he was uh, he was mentally ill until the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the, uh, there was a, a door open to international psychiatry and she realized that he was actually okay. An interesting part of the question is, so was there a difference between Russia and Ukraine? And that's, uh, that's pretty much what I was talking about now. I think uh, the answer is very, very clear. Uh, my experience is a bit different because I lived in Dnipropetrovsk for a while and I heard something similar, so I have a special interest to it. Four or five years ago, we were analyzing the situation in Dnipropetrovsk. Our team and I went to investigate and I was in a room with a, an elderly psychiatrist. She was around, she was over 80 years old. And I said, you've probably worked here for a long time. She said, yes, 47 years. And I said, oh, this is so interesting. So you were here when the dissidents were here. Yes, of course. They were all crazy. And I said, well, this is interesting. Uh, my my friend, uh, Blush, was here. He was not crazy. And she kind of closed up and never said anything else to me. She was absolutely sure that that's exactly how it was. These people were mentally ill. Olga, please. 
Thank you for this discussion. I have a question for Rebecca. You said that uh, in dissident literature, like Bukowski, for example, uh, dissent is defined as thinking differently. And of course, you, uh, you treat norm as a reference point, but who says what the norm is? So in this literature, how is this reflected? And so was this manifested anywhere except for the dying uh, social realism? If I understand your question correctly, where is the norm expressed in psychiatric theory? In fiction. So the fiction, the Russian language fiction of the time. I believe that the dissidents are interested not in the norm as much as how dissent can be produced and acted out. I don't think that they thought about the concept of the norm beyond that. And then I'd like to clarify, if they don't think about the concept of the norm, how can they uh, define themselves as somebody thinking differently? Differently than what? Differently than the government. And differently from each other. So, And um, what about um, in literature? Was this expressed anywhere else? In fiction? of that time. Of course, there's uh, social realism, socialist realism. After the reign of Stalin, Many psychiatrists who came to, into power during Stalin's reign also came into power then. And when they write about fiction, literature, about poetry, about the imagery of mentally ill persons, They use ideas of socialist realism, and this is evident in three books. that were written by um, renowned psychiatrists of the time, Eduard Bovayan, Georgi Marozov. Uh, and with a pref with a foreword from Snezhnevsky himself. They look at the art of um, mentally ill persons. And realism, the realistic art, representative art, yeah, is equated with um, mental stability and sanity, mental health. The other, uh, like real uh, representative art and realistic art, is considered to be the norm or mentally healthy, and anything that's critical is connected uh, to mental illness. Thank you very much. It may be necessary to explain. I think 95% uh, of psychiatrists believe that their patients were mentally ill indeed, but Vartanyan and Marozov 
and Snezhnensky knew perfectly well what they were doing. Vartanian He worked for the government. He was called professor. Zhnevsky's very interesting book written by his former employees. I was given it to read in, uh, I was given it in the 19, in 1995 uh, and asked to publish it, but then quickly asked not to, because if I had published it, then uh, I would not be able to work in the field of psychiatry anymore. I quote it in my book. He was quite expert in uh, social psychiatry. He worked for the government. He did what Andropov and the other leaders would tell him. He was the personal psychiatrist of Panamarov, Andropov, and other members of the Politburo. But he himself uh, made investigations into social psychiatry. So it's uh, the complex uh, Soviet picture that we, that we are used to. Thank you very much. Thank you for this conversation. It was a bit of everything, a bit of history and a bit of the situation in which we find ourselves today. Thank you to all the participants. I'm afraid I may have missed someone in the chat. Today we had a very full conversation. Thank you very much. Those who were speaking, presenting, and those who were listening. Something else in the chat. Thank you to the organizers and experts. Very interesting, very informative. Thank you for your patience. I really hope that we will continue these conversations about particular books. I personally would really like to discuss Rebecca's book because we never talked about her book in particular. There's a lot of interesting things in there. Thank you very much. See you soon. On the 15th of July, we are going to have our final final session about uh, the camp. Uh, it's a book about the camp in Pirn. It's going to be an anniversary of the founding of that camp. And then we'll take a break until autumn. Thank you very much to Rebecca, Peter, Robert, to all of those who spoke today. If you have any questions, do write.